Jane Goodall, by virtue of the authority vested in me and in the Senate of this university, I hereby admit you to the degree of Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. Dr. Jane Goodall will be hooded by Dr. Wade Parkhouse, Vice Provost and Associate Vice President, Academic, and Ms. Romana Khan-Hamani, Registrar and Executive Director of Student Enrollment. It is with great pleasure that I now call on Dr. Jane Goodall for her convocation address. Dr. Goodall. Well, thank you very much for this great honor. And I'm very proud to be standing among you all today, particularly with all these young people about to move out into the world. I've lived in this world for more than 84 years, uh, and I did indeed live in a different era and live through different eras to the one which you are going to enter today. And what we've already been hearing from this podium is some message which is really important for all of you. I've had an extraordinary journey through my 84 years. It's something I could never have imagined when I was young. And during the journey, many people have supported me. We can't do it alone. It's really important to build up friendships. And there are those here today representing the Jane Goodall Institute in Canada. And I want to very especially pay tribute to the one person who helped me the most to do what I've done which has led me to be here today. And that's my extraordinary mother. I was born loving animals, and we heard about curiosity early. And so my early life was marked by curiosity. And the very first time I made a really proper investigation of animal behavior was when I was four years old. And We'd gone to stay on a farm in the country, and we lived in London. So I was excited to meet all these animals face to face. No cruel, intensive factory farms back then. And I was given the job of collecting hen's eggs. And apparently I began asking everybody, but where's the hole on the hen where the egg comes out? I was curious. Nobody told me. And so I hid in a hen house waiting for a hen to come in and lay an egg. I waited for more than four hours, and my family had no idea where I was. And my mother, desperately searching, had even called the police. And yet when she saw this excited little girl running towards the house, instead of getting angry at me, she saw my shining eyes and sat down to hear the wonderful story of how a hen lays an egg. And the reason I tell that story, isn't that the making of a little scientist, the curiosity, asking questions, not getting the right answer, deciding to find out for yourself, and all that curiosity might have been crushed by a mother who instead had said, how dare you go off without telling us, don't you ever dare do that again. So she encouraged my love of animals when I was 10 years old and said I would grow up and go to Africa and live with wild animals and write books about them. Everybody laughed at me, how will you do that? We didn't have any money, Africa was far away. And I was just a girl, and girls didn't do things like that. Jane, dream about something you can achieve. 
not my mother. She said, if you really want this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of all opportunities, but don't give up. I take this message to young people around the world, and I wish mom was alive to know the number of young people, especially from disadvantaged communities, who have said to me, Jane, I want to thank you. You taught me that because you could do it, I can do it too. So I think most of you know that I did get to Africa, met Dr. Louis Leakey, was given the chance to go and observe not just any animal, but chimpanzees, the creature most like us on the planet today. And I had no degree at that time. We couldn't afford university. Louis Leakey decided he wanted somebody without a degree because at that time, scientific thinking was very reductionist. Animals were mere machines. And of course, the Bible says that man is given dominion over the animals. Wrong translation, by the way, if you know Hebrew, that word should be stewardship. So there I was learning about the chimpanzees as you heard, observing them using and making tools, observing their complex social life, observing the close bonds between family members that can last through a life of up to 60 years. And eventually, Louis Leakey told me I would have to go and get a degree. He said, I've got you a place in Cambridge University in England. He said, there's no time for you to mess about with a BA. Mm, well, that's what he said. I've got you a place doing a PhD in ethology. I didn't even know what ethology was, and you couldn't Google in those days. I mean, when I grew up, there wasn't even any television, let alone all these other electronic gadgets. And I was told when I got to the university, rather nervous, that I'd done everything wrong, that I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names, numbers was more scientific. And I couldn't talk about them having personality, mind, and especially emotion, because those were unique to us. But I'd learned differently as a child from my dog, Rusty. You can't live with an animal in a meaningful way and not know that we are not the only beings on the planet with personalities and particularly emotions. And today, any of you young people interested in animal behavior, it is the most exciting time in my life today because science has come out of this closed, rigid box. And we now know the amazing intelligence, not just of chimpanzees and other primates and elephants and dolphins, but also of dogs and octopus and pigs and cows, those creatures that we breed for food. So it's a very exciting time for you. You can study their emotions and you can study their intelligence. I went back to Gombe, built up a research station, had the most amazing days of my life out in the rainforest every day, learning about the interconnectedness of all living things. I left when I realized that right across Africa, chimpanzee numbers were dropping, rainforests were disappearing. I went to Africa to try and find out more about what was happening, and I learned a great deal about what chimpanzees were facing with the beginning of the bushmeat trade and the live animal trade and the destruction of the environment and the growing human populations. But I also learned about the plight of the people living in and around chimpanzee habitat, the crippling poverty, the lack of good health and education facilities, and of course, the ethnic violence. And when I flew over Gombe and saw what had been part of the great equatorial forest belt, and I saw in 1990 just a little oasis of forest surrounded by completely bare hills, people struggling to survive, more people than the land could support. I knew that if we didn't try to help them, there'd be no way that we could try to help the chimpanzees. And so the Jane Goodall Institute began a program to work with the people, listening to them, asking how they thought we could help them, and implementing that as best as we could. And gradually this program expanded. And we were able to new use modern technology, the kind of things that when I was growing up was science fiction. 
using GIS, GPS, satellite imagery, mapping chimpanzee ranges, but also helping the villagers to make land use management plans required by the government, but they didn't have enough money to conduct them. And because they had come to appreciate that we truly were trying to help them in the way that they wanted, not imposed by some group of arrogant white people, they agreed to put land aside for regeneration around the tiny Gombe National Park. They agreed to leave land aside to create leafy corridors, linking the isolated Gombe chimps once again with other remnant communities of chimpanzees. Today, what began with 12 villages around Gombe is in 72 villages throughout the whole range of chimpanzees in Tanzania. And we have similar programs in seven other African countries in and around chimpanzee habitat. It's made a huge difference, not just for the chimpanzees, but for the local people who understand and are able to work towards creating a better environment also for future generations of their own people. And all of this costs money. So I began traveling around the world uh, first of all, just in North America, and then gradually further afield. And everywhere I went, I was meeting many young people like you students here today, and high school students. And many had lost hope. And when I asked them why they felt that way, you've compromised our future, and there's nothing we can do about it. If you think we've compromised your future, you're right. There was a Native American chief who said, we haven't inherited this planet from our parents, we borrowed it from our children, we have not been borrowing your future, we've been stealing it, and we're still stealing it today. You all know about the destruction of the environment. You all know about what's going on in the world today. You all know about the challenges to democracy. Right here, close by you, you have got this pipeline which will destroy the lives of the orcas and other marine creatures like the salmon, and will also destroy the environment around this beautiful university. And this university is creating more and more studies into clean, the clean green future, which must be part of our future, particularly hydrogen technology. And this is what has to happen around the world. Because I do understand that you feel, some of you, that it's pretty hopeless. And there are scientists who say, we're on a downward trajectory, but we have a window of time. And if we all get together and do our bit and realize that every single day each one of us lives, we make a difference on the planet. And we have a choice as to what kind of difference we will make. And that's why I started our Roots and Shoots program, which began with 12 high school students and is now in nearly 80 countries around the world with about 150 active groups, kindergarten, but very strong in university. And I hope that this university will play a major part in helping us grow Roots and Shoots in Canada. The main message that each one of us makes a difference every day. We don't tell the groups what to do because roots and shoots will grow from the ground up and the projects which the students themselves choose relate to the environment they're in, whether they're old or young, whether they're rich or poor. And every group chooses three projects, one to help the world a better place for people, one to help it get better for animals, and one to get it, make it better for the environment that we all share. And at the same time, because we try to bring you with modern technology, groups together around the world to share ideas, to share solutions, to share problems, it's helping young people around the world to understand that whatever the color of our skin, whatever our culture, whatever our religion, if we fall, our blood is the same. If we cry, our tears are the same. And if we laugh, it's because we have that wonderful feeling. And laughter is really important in our lives today. And so 
This program is my main reason for hope, young people understanding the problems and empowered to take action. Second reason for hope, this incredible brain that makes us more different from other animals than anything else, finding new technologies to help us live in greater harmony with each other and with nature. The resilience of nature, no more bare hills around Gombe, animals on the brink of extinction, given another chance. And let's hope that these orcas, these famous orcas living here, will be given another chance and not have their entire system contaminated by the hundreds of tankers that will come in if this oil pipe is actually built. My next reason for hope, social media, we can bring you young people and others together from all around the world to protest at climate change, to protest about the encroachment on democracy, to encroach about the, the other issues which you feel are important. And finally, the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle what seems impossible and won't give up, the people who suffer tremendous physical disabilities and lead lives that are inspirational to all those around them. And so, for all of you young people setting out on your journey through life, Remember, make good friends, rely on them. You can't do it alone. And the more we get together and the sooner we get together, the better life will be for your children and theirs after them. So good luck to all of you. And again, thank you for having me here on this very special day.